welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees. You stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord and let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come into this place to hear from a man. We haven't come into this place to hear from a woman. We've come into this place to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts this day. Here's our hearts. Fill it with your way and your will and your want and your desire, your passion. And Lord, as you bless us, we would ask also that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity and Ecclesia in the way. We give you praise and glory for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom that's yours. We thank you, God, for your great wisdom where there's a church for everybody. And we give you the praise for your glory that's displayed. Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. amen. Well, as you take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Once again, we're going to do something. Last week when we were talking, we talked about why Christians fail, and the example out of the fourth chapter, and I want you to hear this, is the children of Israel who were taken from bondage of Egypt, God wanted them to go into the promised land. Remember, as they're going into the promised land, they stop, they hesitate, they give up, they quit. They never get going with God, and they never get to their promised land. If you approach the Word of God as if it's some history lesson, you'll never get anything out of it. Can you imagine going to heaven someday and God says, well, you are a great historian. I'm glad you get, you know, brownie points because you're a historian. It doesn't work that way. This is not a history lesson. What we're looking at in the fourth chapter is you. This is a story about you and about me. We learn how to live life by looking at the Word of God and applying the Word of God, which is the manual on how to do life in our hearts and in our lives. We learn how to raise our children. We learn how to love our spouse. We learn how to do business and make wise business decisions and operate within the perimeters of the economic system that God developed for each and every one of us. How to do life is found here, not here. And oftentimes what we do is we look to our own ideologies and philosophies on how to do life. And this story that we're seeing about the children of Israel were a group of people that God loved very much, just like you and just like me, that never got into their own personal promised land never got to be successful as a Christian or as a believer. We're the same exact way today. We could live our life on this planet, die and go to heaven and still miss out on all the things that God has for us to do while we're here on the planet and not be a very successful people. God wants you to fulfill every area of his life. God's got a personal promised land to take you to. You have value, you have worth. The highest price that could be paid for anything upon the planet was God himself, and he paid that price for you. Don't tell me 
you don't have value. Don't tell me you don't have purpose. Don't tell me you don't have a destiny. Don't tell me there's not a reason why you're planted on this earth and left here. There's something that God would have you to do. And as we look at the scripture, we're learning how, let me say it again, we're learning how to do life. If you're going to learn how to do life, learn from the one who created life. Don't learn from somebody who thinks they know something about life. But learn from the one who created life. Last week we talked about, in part number one of this, why Christians fail, we talked about four areas. We could have given you 40. God did give me a fifth, which we'll talk about today. But these four areas of this, number one, People fail because of unbelief. They just simply don't believe God. They, were, they live in a world of the natural and they can't see into the spiritual. Nor can they believe that God could really care for them and love them. Number two, we found out they hear but they don't do. And nothing could be worse than hearing what God says and not doing it. Stop and think about it for a moment. If God's going to take you to your personal promised land, have you ever thought about how he's going to get you there? Is he going to hit you in the head with a two by four? Is he going to make you miserable until you get there? Is he just going to open the door and push you through? How is he going to get you to your own personal promised land? Here's how he got everybody to where they needed to be in the scripture. He spoke to them and they learned to hear his voice and they followed him. It's that simple. God's not into beating the snot out of you until you finally learn something. Somebody ought to give me a thank God for that. God is into speaking to you and you hearing what he has to say. And that takes somebody that's very, very spiritual to do. Number three, we found out last week that Christians fail because they don't count the cost. Everything in your life and my life, we count up. We don't go to school without figuring out how many years it's going to take us. We don't strategize to get a degree until we finally realize and sit down that this is a strategy in order to get that. We never enter into the business world or do business. We never look at our future without counting the cost of whatever it is that we do. But when it comes to Christendom, when it comes to you and God, you don't count the cost at all, and neither do I sometimes, and we find ourselves failing in life because we haven't really caught the cost of what it's going to cost us to get to where we need to be with God. Fourth thing, so fascinating, is that we live carnal lives, and we're talking about that on Wednesday nights, how not to live that carnal life. A carnal life is somebody who just decides where to go and how to get there, what God wants for them, get directions from God based on their flesh. And you'll never get anything based on the flesh. But we're so in tune with the flesh that we're carnal-minded people. And we're so fleshly that we make decisions based on what we think and what we feel and on our emotions and our senses instead of what the Spirit of the Lord speaks to us. And it's carnal-mindedness that keeps us from the blessings of God. And today, God has brought us to a place where there's one more reason that he pointed out to me this last week and emphasized. I don't have three or four. I have one today. Here it is, number five on why Christians fail, the hardening of our hearts. Oftentimes, we don't even know that our hearts are hard. We don't even realize that over the years things have happened and things have dealt with us and we've been conditioned by the ways of the world and people we associate with and things that we hear and things that we have seen over the years that literally hardened the heart so that we don't receive from God whatsoever. And we keep living our lives and we never get the direction. We never get the insight. We never get the plan of God. We never get the blessings of God. We never get the open doors because we're too hard on our heart to hear from the voice of the Lord. The hardening of the heart is an amazing thing. I want to just show it to you in scripture as we look at the children of Israel and the warnings that God says two times in just a few verses. 
First, let's take a look at the fourth chapter, verse number five. It says this, and again in this place, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse six, since therefore it remains that some must enter it. Thank God that's going to be you and me. And those whom who we have first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Verse number seven comes along and it says these words. Uh, again, he designates a certain day saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you hear, big word, if. How's God going to direct you to your personal promised land? How are you going to get out of the frustrating life that you live right now? How are you going to get out of boredom and mundaneness? How are you going to get out of insecurities that you're at? How are you going to get to the place where God wants you to be? Let me tell you something. God's going to speak to you. And if you don't know how to listen to God and you don't know how to hear from God, there's no way you're ever going to get to where you need to be. He says this word, if you hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. Did you know he just said that in the chapter before that? Chapter 3, verse number 15, just pop it up on the overhead. He says, and while he says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Can I say something? When God repeats himself two times in two chapters, we better pay attention. We can be like the children of Israel that have the promised land right before us and never get to the promised land and God wants to take you to your personal promised land and we'll never get there. And you know why we never get there? Because somewhere along the line, something happened to us and we hardened our hearts. I've got news for you. Can I just say this to you? Bad things happen to everybody. Not just you alone. Bad things happen to everybody. And when bad things happen, we insulate ourselves and we try to isolate ourselves so the pain of what happened before won't happen again. And oftentimes, it brings us to a place where we harden our heart. Think about it just for a moment. If I had in my hand a foot and a half dried out stick that had been a stick for about a oh, year and a half, and it's dried out in the sun, and I took it before you, and I held both ends of it, and I popped the stick, what would happen? It would just crack open. Why? Because there's no moisture in the stick. It is not very flexible at all. But if I took something that had moisture running through it, had life running through it, it would be very flexible, that same kind of a stick. Why? Because when life flows through something, it becomes very flexible. Now, hear me. Why God used Moses above everybody else. The Bible says he was the meekest man in all of the earth. Do you know what the word meek means? It means flexible, pliable. When God spoke, sure, he had some tough times believing it, but he still did what God wanted him to do. And you and I have got to realize that the things of our past, the things that we have experienced, the things that come along, what people say, what people think, what we've seen over the years, what we ourselves think ourselves of, where we are and who we hang around with, oftentimes hardens a heart and we don't even know it. So that when God speaks, we never get to do what he wants us to do. A hardened heart is something for that ruins marriages and ruins lives and ruins children. A hardened heart ruins futures and destinies and purposes. The best thing about a hardened heart is you don't have to have it. Look at this verse. It says, do not harden your heart. It's you that hardens your heart, not God. The responsibility of your heart, the responsibility of the condition of my heart is not what God says, it's what I do. Well, oftentimes we'll say, oh God, take care of my heart. Keep it flexible, keep it pliable. Oh God, we're praying to God and God's yelling back at us. It's not my job, it's your job. The conditions of your heart, the condition of your heart is your responsibility. And we don't see that. My heart can be pliable and flexible. My heart can be tender and soft and receive the life of God. 
or my heart can be because of the abuse of the past, because of the problems in life that I've seen, because of what I've learned from a world that's midst of corruption and decay and sin. I can get to the place when my heart gets so hard that when God speaks, I don't listen to him at all. For all of us in here, it's our responsibility. I'm going to give you a definition, if I may, and it's just kind of really an insight. I'll put it in terms that you can easily understand. A hard heart has no flexibility to adapt to the spiritual things. A hard heart has no flexibility to adapt to spiritual things. So when God speaks to you spiritual things, it's like, well, wait a minute, we don't do it that way. I don't see it that way. It doesn't calculate my thinking. It's not the way I would speak about that. That's not what I want. And we have no flexibility to adapt to spiritual things. And all of a sudden, because of the pains and the problems of the past, your heart gets hard. And when your heart gets hard, guess what? Can I say this to you? You are absolutely vulnerable to failure in the future. Can I tell you something? If Satan can get your heart, he's got your life. Doesn't care whether you're a Christian going to heaven or not. You'll never take anybody else with you. Here's why. Because you have no future. Instead of people coming saying, wow, I love watching your life. It's so great. Can you tell me what you're doing? And you tell them about Jesus. You'll have no witness whatsoever because he's got your heart. And the children of Israel never got in the promised land because they hardened their heart when God spoke instead of just believing God and that's the way it is and that settles it. Guess what they did? They said no and they did what they thought because they were not flexible to the things of the Lord. Jesus talks about it in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark the 8th chapter. Uh, go with me in the New Testament, Mark the 8th chapter, and it's an illustration that is really fascinating. We can learn a lot by it. Are you listening at all today? In Mark, the 8th chapter, we're talking about this hardening of our hearts as an area that will cause us to fail as Christians. In the Mark, the 8th chapter, let me set you up by reading some verses. Verse number 13 of the eighth chapter of Mark says it like this, and he left them getting in his boat again and departing to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. So they were responsible for bringing the bread and the food, and they got so caught up in what was going, they forgot to do their job. And now they're frustrated about it, if you will, in verse number 15. So Jesus starts to speak to them about something spiritual for their life. Listen to this in verse number 15. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. In other words, here comes this amazing warning about the condition of their heart and not to get so placed in such a way that they miss the things of God. And yet at the same time, that's verse number 15 and verse number 16, and they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we have no bread? And Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Do you not yet perceive nor under? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not yet perceive? In other words, have you not been with me long enough to see the difference between what is spiritual and what isn't? I spoke to you about something spiritual and you took it immediately and put it into the natural. Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? A hardened heart's not flexible to hear the voice of the Lord or to adapt to spiritual things. Here is Jesus coming along saying something spiritual. If they will understand that, it'll save them a lot, help them a lot, bless them a lot, keep them away from being where they don't need to be and keep them out of their uh, 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 problem area and get them into their own personal promised land. He made a statement to them that's absolutely dynamic. And yet they missed it because they were thinking about the bread. Why? Because the bread was more important to them than the spiritual things. And he says, is your heart still hardened? Sometimes we'll come into the house of God and you know what? We won't hear the word of God. It's just a guy with a big mouth preaching in front, speaking about something and guess what? We're really not there at all when God is saying biblical spiritual principles that'll change and bless your life. 
And that's exactly what happened. So now Jesus goes from verse number 17, verse number 18, and he starts to talk to them about this. In verse number 18, he makes this statement, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Stop right there. You have eyes to see, you have ears to hear. And the answer to that is yes, we do. And then he comes along and makes this statement, verse number 18, and do you not remember? In other words, you saw me spiritually before. How come you haven't seen me and hear me spiritually now? There's a time when you can hear spiritually before and not hear spiritually now because our hearts got hardened. Is anybody listening? And verse number 19 comes along and says this, when I broke the five loaves into the 5,000, how many baskets of fragments did you take up? And they said 12. He says, and when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? In other words, you saw miracles before your very eyes. And instead of hearing what I'm saying that's spiritual that'll help you, you now just see the carnal. You saw it. You didn't remember it. You didn't apply it. Then he comes along and makes this statement. Verse number 21. So he said to them, how is it if you do not, how is it that you do not understand my friends, listen to what I'm going to say to you. You and me both can get to a place where we don't understand what God's saying. And when we do, how in the world are you going to get to your personal promised land? You're going to have to make some effort, so am I, to find out what's going to take that my heart not be hardened so that when God speaks to me, tells me to go here and do this and do that, do this and do that, can I tell you something? I go and do and what exactly what he says so that I can get into my own personal promised land. I am learning how to hear from the voice of the Lord in the house of God. Because if I can't hear from the voice of the Lord in the house of God, you think I'm going to hear from the voice of the Lord in this busy world? I'm learning how to do this. And Jesus makes it very clear that even his own disciples can find themselves at times of not being used. Listen, go with me to Proverbs, the fourth chapter. Proverbs of the fourth chapter. In Proverbs, the fourth chapter, I'm going to set you up with how not to have a hardened heart. Is that okay? Four little things that you simply, quickly can do every day not to have a hardened heart. I'll start by reading to you in verse number 20 of the fourth chapter of Proverbs because it really describes some real truth. And then let me, if you remember, keep in mind why Christians fail is because of a hardened heart. That's our subject. Verse number 20, it says, my son, give attention to my words. If you don't give attention to the word of God, where are you putting your attention? Wait a minute. You want to be blessed. You want to be financially blessed and marriages work and children working. You want doors to be open for you. You want doors to be closed that need to be closed. You want God to go before you. God wants to take you to a personal promised land. He wants you to live an abundant life. Let me tell you something. If you don't pay attention to what God's word says, you got problems. Incline thine ear to my saying. In other words, hear what I'm saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Didn't say in the perimeter of your heart. Didn't say outside your heart. Didn't say think about them once in a while. In the very midst of your heart. Do you know what he just described? When a problem outside comes in, you've got something on the inside to counteract the problem on the outside. The word of God on the inside of my heart is bigger than the problem that comes on the outside. So instead of me getting a hardened heart, guess what I do? I keep because of the midst of my heart is God's word. So all of the garbage from the outside comes, but there's a greater pressure on the inside in the midst of my heart. Are you hearing me? And notice what it says. Keep them. Whose job? Whose responsibility? Oh, God, keep me, we pray. Oh, God, keep me, God. Keep me from sinning. Keep me from this. Keep me from that. God's yelling back, keep yourself. I gave you the power of the Holy Spirit. I gave you my words, your responsibility. You can do all things through Christ. That's right, thank you. Sorry, I got a little radical there, didn't I? Sure, though. I love this. Let's take a look at it. It goes on. For they are life to those who find them. Notice the word find. In other words, they're hidden, you're going to have to find them. 
It's not going to drop on you because you stayed home today and ate an apple. Didn't go to the park, didn't have a picnic, but you're going to have to find, get to a place where you can find the word of God. Because they're health to all of our flesh, the Bible says. Verse number 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. All diligence means, man, it is absolutely vital. That you keep your, nobody can keep your heart, it's you that keeps your heart. Everything in the world will try to penetrate your heart, try to come in and settle in your heart, try to make you hard-hearted, try to cause you to be an outcast, try to cause you to think wrongly and contrary to the ways of God. And that's a hard heart, not receiving the word of God, hearing it but not doing it. And you're going to have to get to a place where you diligently, diligently, everybody say diligently, diligently keep your heart. For out of it springs the issues of life. The issues of life is a big deal. Everything you do, everything that matters, everything that comes out. Did you know all of us have issues? Some have good issues. Some have bad issues. But we all have issues. Look at my shirt. I have obviously got issues at my age to wear this shirt. We've all got issues. If you don't deal with the issues when you're young by the word of God, when you get old, you'll be a cranky old person that nobody wants to be around. And don't tell me you don't know a few. (laughs) And how you deal with those issues is how you set yourself free. Out of it springs the issues of life, the issues of your family, the issues of your marriage, Issues of your job, the issues of your finances, the issues of your economy, the issues of your neighbors, issues of your relatives, issues of your friends, issues of everything. Everything is dealt from the heart. It's all about the heart. When my kids were little, I didn't like the people they hang around. Some of them I didn't like at all. I didn't like what they thought. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't like the way they think. I don't like what they thought was important. And I didn't know what to do about it except ask God, God, I'm asking you to protect their heart. I'm I'm one of those parents that would love to have taken some of my kids and literally put them in a deep freeze until they were 25 years old and thaw them out. I would never embarrass any of my children by pointing them out. But today they all serve the Lord. Today they're all preachers of the gospel. The most important thing is the heart. And you can't stop your kids from thinking the way they think and what's important to them at their age the way they calculate problems and deal with friends, and where they want to go and what they want to do. Of course, you can stop them from that. But let me tell you something. What you need to do as a parent is you need to pray for their heart. This is all and always has been about the heart. If the heart's right, the kid responds as they grow up in the ways of the Lord. Everybody listen. For out of it are the issues of life. Now, here he makes a statement, and then he tells us what to do. In the next couple of minutes, I'm going to go through four things. Can you believe I can do it in a couple of minutes? I can. Because that's important that out of the heart is the issues of life. Here's how to keep your heart. Verse number 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put it perverse lips far from you. Circle the word mouth and write the word say. Verse 25, S-A-Y, say. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Circle the word eyes and put the word see, S-E-E. Verse 26, ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. Circle the word ponder and write think, T-H-I-N-K. 
Verse 27, do not run, turn to the right or to the left. Remove your feet from evil. Circle the words, remove your feet and write the word stand, S-T-A-N-D. Four things that you can do every day that'll help your heart to stay pliable and flexible, to receive the life that God has for you for the future to take you into your own personal promised land. Number one, what you say. Number two, what you put your eyes on and see. Number three, what you think during the day. And number four, who you stand with and where you stand. If I'm going to say something, it better be the things of God. If I'm going to see something, I want to see what God would have me to see. If I'm going to think something, I want to think what God says. And if I'm going to stand, it's not going to be in the midst of garbage. It'll be in the midst of the things of God. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Four simple things. For an example, faith comes by hearing, Romans tells us, and by the word of God. If faith comes by hearing the word of God, then faith goes by not hearing it. What you say has a lot to do with where you're going. What you set your eyes on has a lot to do with what you'll become. And what you see is only what you will become. Are you following me? And what you think is what you happen. The Bible makes it very clear. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if I'm thinking garbage, guess what I will become? Garbage. If I'm thinking evil, I will operate in evil. If I allow thinking to continue that's in the perverse or sin or garbage, won't be long before I'm acting in the sin and the garbage which brings me to death. And then who I stand with, what I stand with, I can either stand in the midst of scorners against the things of God or I can stand with the believers who say yes amen God is real and alive and upon the planet four things what you see what you say what you think and where you stand will determine the condition of your heart because out of your heart come the issues of life. Now listen click quickly to what I'm gonna to say to you. I can't control always what I see. I even can't control what I hear that people say to me. I can't say, oh, I'm not listening to that. I got away from me, I was demons possessed. That stuff, I don't, you're gonna hear it. I can't always control everything I think. But here's what I can do. I can finish every moment of an evil thought, an evil stand, an evil sentence, an evil view with the things of God. But God says, but God says, but God says. I hear that, but what God says. I don't choose to listen to that. I'm gonna say what God says. And the last thing in your heart will condition your heart. Is anybody listening? For every one of us that are in here, a hardened heart will ruin your future. But a tender heart gets you to the place where you can hear from the Spirit of the Lord into your own personal promised land. If God spoke to you, give him a great big praise the Lord. We do that. Isn't that a good word? Healthy, healthy, healthy. Simple yet profound. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, just real quick, we're having a, an event that we have. One of the events of the years that we do is that we give out back-to-school supplies to children that are in need. It's not your children. It's the children that live in the city of San Bernardino. And we give out thousands of backpacks filled with school equipment like papers, pencils, pins, erasers and so on, rulers. There's $20, each one costs $20 to do the math. And um, it's just our way of saying to the city that we love the children, we wanna help them get strong. Somebody cares about them and somebody loves them. So if you'd like to volunteer, there's a tent outside where you can go with the team out to the park and help pass it out and love on the people and 
Encourage them. It's a great time. You're going to come back feeling like you really did something for the Lord. It's really great. Or maybe you can't make it or whatever, and you'd like to just throw in a $20 bill as you go past. We, we need some finances to do this. So if you'd like to throw down a 20, you can. You can throw down a one or two or five or hundred thousand million five million billion anything you have help us to reach out to the kids uh, it'll be a real blessing I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God then I'll let you go give me a couple minutes listen to what I'm going to say to you every one of us hope to go to heaven someday every one of us are going to die and you will stand either before God or you will be in hell. That's what the scripture says. And somebody needs to tell you. You do not get to go to heaven because you're nice, pretty, smart, talented, gifted. Or because, you know, you think you're going to make it and you just hope you're going to get there. You get to heaven exactly the way Jesus says. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me, which means you can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. Some of you think you're going to get to heaven because you're really a good person. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? It's not in the Bible. Did you know that? Some of you think you're going to go to heaven because you love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible says because you love God you get to go to heaven. Some of you think you're going to go to heaven because, you know, your mom and dad told you you were a Christian when you were a kid, took you and had you baptized or christened when you were a baby, put a cross or Saint Christopher around your neck and took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Can I ask you a question? Could you show me that in the scripture? Because it's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. That's why Jesus makes this statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. No man goes to heaven except his way. You can't get there my way. We can't get there your way. We can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly what his way is in the scripture. See if it fits for you. John 3rd chapter says, you must be born again. Immediately when you hear the words born again, a lot of you just get hard hardened, hard hearted. And you know why? Because movies and television and theatrical things and books have portrayed born again people as crazy radical idiots. And I'm here to tell you that's not what God was talking about. Born again means something. Here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Let me tell you so that you know. Born again means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. It's all or nothing and I'll prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He said, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? Here's what he just really said. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are going to get expelled from Jesus. Let's define what lukewarm is. You don't want to be there. It's a little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life but he's not everything. He's something, but he's not everything. That's, whole, that's lukewarm. And you're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough 
to tell you the truth. Today, it's your day of salvation. You have a divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments with plumbers and attorneys and, you know, different people in your life. But this one today, God brought you here because today is your day of salvation. When you give God all of your heart, you give God all of your life. Today is your day. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I give him all of my heart? How do I give him all of my life? Jesus says these words, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see it. By the raising of your hand, you're making a statement. Here's your statement. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Now stop and think about it just for a moment. I already know you know who Jesus is. But that won't get you to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven. Having head knowledge won't get you to heaven. It's about what you've done with your heart. You gotta give him all of your heart. You gotta give him all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven. I already know you celebrate Christmas. I already know you celebrate Easter. This is not about having head knowledge. It's about giving him all of your heart. And in this safe and friendly place, we have laughed, we've sung, we've clapped, we've shouted. You heard the word, it was great. But today, you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Be born again headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. In a moment as I pop my hands together, bang, you'll hear that sound. Your hand goes up and I'll see it. I'll see it. You say, Pastor Jim, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in, a mo in this safe place than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever, because you chose to care more about what people think instead of what God sees? I don't think so. Today it's your call. Today it's your life. Today it's your future. Today someone told you the truth. Will you respond or will you remain hard-hearted to the things that God has for you? I'm counting to three. Been running from God instead of to God? Get ready to put your hand up. Never given him all of your heart? Get ready to put your hand up. You've never given him all of your life. You know who you are. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure. Oh, here it is. Ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty, sixty, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, two, one. Thank you. Back there. Twenty-one, twenty-two. Thank you. Back over on this side. Twenty-two, twenty-three in the family room. Back here. Twenty-three. Thank you. I got that. Twenty-three. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? There's 24. God bless you. There's 25, 26. Thank you. There's 27, 28, 29. Thank you. Got you. Back there. Anybody else? There's 29. If you want to give your heart and life to Jesus. There's 30 back in that family room. I think I may have counted them twice, but maybe not. There's 30 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? You're going to miss this. Anybody else? Is that you back there or are you just stretching? Just stretching. Okay. Guess what? I stretched my way into heaven. No, I don't think so. You, God watches your heart. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. 31. God bless you. Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 31 wise people. Here's what we're going to do. All 31 of you, I want you to get hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Now listen to me. You don't get saved by raising your hand. I want you to get out of your seat, get your stuff, bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Cut the bowl. Get out of your seat. Get up here if you're going to give Jesus your heart and life. Now listen, no one leaves during this period of time. Let's welcome them up front. If you didn't raise your hand, you can come too. You come now. Come, 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 come. come just Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, and hear the Spirit call. Come on, come on out of the family room. Oh, Help them, ushers, out of that family room. Just as you are. Come and see. 
Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Give them a hand. They're still coming. Give them a hand. Come on. Come on. From this side. Come on. Hurry up. And you'll never thirst Well, thank God you guys have come real quick. I want you to look over to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name's Pastor Dave. He's going to pray with you, give you some free information, tell you about a program we have that'll help you stay strong and get strong. Spiritual, personal trainers. He'll tell you what that means. It's really kind of cool. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.